Today, as we continue in our journey through the book of Mark, we come to a chapter that is known as the Olivet Discourse, chapter 13. So please open your Bibles to Mark 13. The message is titled, Inside Information. Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist, and he was a man who made a fortune by one of his inventions. Anybody know what he invented? Dynamite. Explosives. And he made a fortune because that device was turned into many weapons of war. And as you know, we are a, a world that has many wars. And years later, when his brother passed away, they mistakenly thought it was Alfred and listed his obituary. And in it, he was described as a man who richly enabled people to kill one another by unprecedented numbers because of dynamite and other powerful explosives that came from it. Shaken by that assessment that he received in his obituary, it caused him to do some internal searching. And he decided that he wanted to use his fortune to honor those accomplishments that benefited humanity, thus the Nobel Peace Prize. He, in essence, had a sneak preview into how he would be remembered when they mistakenly listed him as dying instead of his brother. One might say he got a glimpse of the future today. Well, he had received inside information, and it gave him the opportunity to change and to use his resources for good in humanity. Well, similarly, God gives us the opportunity to make changes because Jesus has given us a glimpse into the future today in the Bible passage that we're going to look at. How is this information going to change in your life? Will you be taking a different perspective like Alfred Nobel did? How will you live your life differently based upon what you hear and learn from this passage? You know, a few subjects in the Bible spark greater interest than the study of eschatology, which is the study of end times. Christians and non-Christians alike all want to know and are fascinated by the topic. And they want to know when the world is going to come to an end. Some are skeptical about much of, the, much of what they see and read. And unfortunately, much of this skepticism is warranted because there's so many people that have false and made false assumptions based on the word of God. Man, when you consider all the, the false predictions and the pseudo prophets and the procrastinate or pro, uh, pro, not, prognosticators, I can spit that word out eventually, have made in the past. Many of you will remember that back in 1988, many evangelical Christians looked rather foolish when they were seduced by Edgar Wisenant's uh, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 1988. Any of y'all remember that? I know that was a long time ago. I was just out of high school. Well, not to be undone, many New Age advocates cited that the Mayan calendars predicted the end of the world, and that would happen on December 21st, 2012. Any of y'all remember that? There was a movie even made about that. They, of course, were wrong as well. We could continue down this tragic trail for quite some time, considering hundreds, if not thousands, of people have claimed to know the future and when the world is going to end. Everyone seems to claim that they have some sort of inside information. Well, Jesus addressed the issues related to end times in this Olivet Discourse. And it was delivered on the Mount of Olives. And that's why it's called the Discourse of, of Olivet. We see it in Matthew 24. We read about it in Mark 13, which we're going to look at today. And also Luke chapter 21. What we will not find is Jesus encouraging anyone to set dates or attempt to identify who the Antichrist might be, who is the false prophet or the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He doesn't do that. So why are... We, as a, as a society, so enthralled by those things which Jesus says are important. Because if they were, he would have told us. But instead, 
he admonishes us to be on guard. We're going to see that in verse 9, verse 23, and verse 33. And we're going to be told to stay awake in 35 and 37, to be alert. That's what Jesus tells us to do. And he says, no one but God knows when the end will come. And we'll get to that later in the chapter on another Sunday morning. But however, since we know the end will come and it will come suddenly, we must remain constantly faithful in our service to our master until we breathe our last breath or that moment arrives, the day of the Lord. Amen. It won't be easy because persecution will gradually increase as he tells us in this chapter, but it will be worth it all when we stand face to face with Jesus and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Mark 13 is a very difficult passage to interpret, and many faithful Bible-believing teachers differ in their opinions on what the details of the scriptures mean. Some are convinced that Jesus is only addressing the destruction of, of Jerusalem in AD 70. Others are equally certain that it only has the view of the end times. Well, I personally think there is a third and better understanding of what this chapter in this uh, book of Mark means and it's this because Jesus does definitely address some imminent destruction that is coming to the city of Jerusalem just a few decades from when he spoke these words in AD 70 but he also in doing this provides a preview of things that are in the distant future Amen. it is a both and He's talking about his second coming in the end of the age as well as the destruction that Israel would see in the city of Jerusalem. And John Graspick writes in his Bible knowledge commentary these words, and I agree with them. Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which prompted the disciples to inquire about the timing of these things. Apparently, they associated the destruction of the temple with the end of the age found in Matthew 24. In reply, Jesus skillfully wove together into a unified discourse a prophetic scene involving two perspectives. One, the near event, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. And secondly, the far event, the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds with all his power and glory. The former local event was the forerunner of the latter universal event. In this way, Jesus followed the precedent of Old Testament prophets by predicting a far future event in terms of a near future event whose fulfillment, at least for some of the, his hearers, would see in person. This generation, they would see it. Also, we will see it. Jesus will employ no more than 19 different imperatives in this chapter of Mark as he instructs us on how to be prepared, how to be ready, how to be alert, how to, how to be uh, ready when he comes and by being obedient to what he's given us to accomplish before the end times arrive. Many are surprised both by what he says and what he does not say. So let's look at the inside information that Jesus provides us this morning, but first let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you with humble hearts. We have minds that are inquisitive. We have imaginations that you've given us to wonder about things of this world. But Lord, when your word is clear, we need to pay attention to it. There are things that are going to take place in the future that you have not given us the ability to understand. And I thank you for that. Because if we understood everything that was going to take place, I think it would change our perspective and our view. And you are the one who created us. So you know what we can comprehend. You know what we can cope with. You know what we can handle. And this is one of those areas that you don't give us great detail about. But the things that you do mention and the things that you don't mention, we need to pay attention to. So I pray that as we journey through this book of Mark and these difficult uh, verses that are in chapter 13, that you will clear our minds of any distractions, of any of the things that we've heard in the past that might lead us to a false conclusion, but only to focus on the things that are true and right. May your spirit move among us. May it guide us. May it change us. And may we be found faithful servants 
in all the things that we do as a church and as individuals that make up the church. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found acceptable in your sight. You are my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. And it is in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that I ask all these things. Amen. Well, let's begin by looking at the first four verses as we look to see what inside information Jesus provides us here. As he was going out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what massive stones, what impressive buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will happen, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So the first thing we see here in these first four voices, verses is, When will it happen? is the question that comes to mind. Have you ever seen a person, have you ever seen in person or at least a picture of the magnificent glaciers that are in the north, uh, the northern hemisphere? Man, up close, they are massive in size and they're absolutely beautiful in crisp, this crystal blue color that just emanates from them. And the blue color is a result of the extreme cold environment in which they are. And some of those glaciers are so massive that they can stretch for miles and miles. It is truly a sight to behold. Well, that's kind of the same understanding that the disciples had when they looked upon the temple. This was a massive, massive structure. It had the same kind of awe that we have when we look at glaciers that they had when they looked at the temple and the temple mount. It was massive in scope and size. Herod's temple, in fact, was considered to be one of the great wonders of the ancient world. There was no temple in the world like it that could rival its size or grandeur. Did you know that there were 162 different pillars that were holding up the exterior roof around the outer court of the temple? Each pillar was so large that three men reaching out their arms could not even wrap around a pillar, touching fingertip to fingertip. It's massive. The temple itself rose 150 feet higher than the rest of the city and making the temple complex essentially a man-made mountain with the plans that were given to them by God. It stood out above everything. It had been under construction for 46 years and was just nearing its completion. And it was located on a spectacular site, Mount Moriah. Anybody remember where that comes from? Where did Abraham go to sacrifice his son, Mount Moriah? Well, Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote these words concerning the temple. Listen to what he says. The exterior of the building wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye. It wanted for nothing, rather. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from solar rays. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain, for all that was not overlaid with gold was of the purest white, end quote. Some of the foundation stones of the temple were 40 feet long and 12 feet tall. That's the size of this sanctuary almost. Did you know that? That's how big these stones were, just one of them. It's massive. And they were pure white in their appearance. And this may have been what prompted the disciples to say, Teacher, look, what massive stones there are here in this temple complex. Well, the courtyard of the temple had been greatly enlarged to over 400 uh, by 500 yards in order to accommodate the large masses of Jews that would come into the temple complex for the festivals each and every year. It was covered in approximately one-sixth of the area of the city of Jerusalem was just the temple complex. Well, in verse 2, instead of carrying on a polite conversation of, of the greatness of the temple, the disciples heard a shocking thing from Jesus. 
And he said this to them in response. The teacher looked with massive stones. Listen to what he says. Not one stone will be left upon another. All of them will be thrown down. Imagine the incredible power of devastation that it would take to accomplish that. That's kind of like us in the United States saying that the White House and the halls of Congress will be wiped off the face of the earth. Those are massive structures. That's what they were basically telling, uh, Jesus was telling his disciples. He was giving them prophecy because he knew what was going to take place in just a few short decades. And we know from history that that prophecy came true when the Roman army came in and destroyed and conquered Jerusalem. And if you travel to Jerusalem today, you will see portions of the original temple complex that still remain. One of those is the Wailing Wall. That's where Jews go to offer their prayers on a scheduled basis. So wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say that not one stone would be left unturned? How are there still stones standing? Well, remember what Jesus said. He said, do you see these great buildings? He didn't see, do you see these walls? He said, do you see these great buildings? And every single building that was there was destroyed and not one stone was left on another. Well, why did that happen? Why was every stone overturned by the Roman army? Well, as I said, the, the stones that were built around the buildings were covered in gold plate. Well, guess how they decided to destroy the complex when they got there? With fire. And guess what happened to all that gold? It melted. And all of that molten gold ran between the grooves and the cracks of the bricks or the stones that were there. So in order to get at all the gold, they were instructed to tear down every stone to get to the gold. And that's what they did. And that's how they destroyed it. Then in verse 3, we see the insiders here. We see Peter, James, and John. We know they form the inner circle of Jesus' closest disciples. But also we, we hear Andrew being here. That's Peter's brother. And he got to be a part of this private time of instruction with the master about the destruction of the temple. The Mount of Olives rises 150 feet above Jerusalem, so it offered a very dramatic view of the temple. And if you remember from our study through Zechariah, Zechariah prophesied that the Lord would return to that Mount of Olives. Verse 4, the disciples asked two key questions of Jesus here. He says, tell us when these things will happen. And when, when will the signs, or, or what will be the signs of all these things are about to be accomplished? So they're wanting to know, when will this happen? What are the signs? Wouldn't you want to know? If Jesus said those things to you, absolutely you would. These questions have been asked over and over and over across the centuries of every follower of Christ when they come to this passage of Scripture. They have those questions in their minds. That's why people spend so much time trying to figure it out. Almost everyone wants to know when they read this prophetic section of scripture. When will these things happen? These are familiar words that Jesus foretells of what will happen when he returns. But the question which really sees the minds of men has always been when? 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 Why do we want to know when so desperately? Is it going to cause us to change the way we live if we do when? I don't know, maybe some, probably most won't, but we have each generation asking these questions and each one has hunches of when Jesus might return and some of them make those professions and every time somebody does, I can say, well, I can guarantee it's not going to happen on that day. Amen. Well, Jesus eventually does answer this question, but not in the way they expected because there is a double perspective, as I laid out in the opening remarks, that some of these events described here will take place in the near future, but some are also in the distant future at the time of his second coming. Yet throughout Jesus' revelation, he was more concerned about the preparation of his disciples for the trials that were going to be coming their way. And he wanted them to be ready for them. He cared about them to be prepared. 
He wasn't concerned about dates and signs for them to worry about. Get ready for what's coming. Be ready, prepared for the time of destruction. Be ready and prepared for what's going to take place that I'm going to tell you. And as we examine this account, to ask the question when is asking the wrong question. Jesus makes it clear that if you focus on the when, you're going to be misled and ultimately you can be deceived by asking that question. Because that's what's happened to so many people. So many teachers, they've been led astray trying to figure out when. Well, Jesus doesn't ignore the question, but he does answer it. He does answer it later on in the chapter, which we'll get to in coming weeks. Let's move on to verse five. Jesus told them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will deceive many. So you see the sense of urgency that Jesus has here. He's warning his disciples, don't worry about when. Watch out that no one deceives you. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must take place, but it is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. Now we see in these verses, how will it happen? First, we've asked the, the disciples have asked the question, when will it happen? Now we get to see how it will happen. Verse 5 is a more, de as, as a, a more detailed account available to us in Matthew 24, as well as in Luke. Because Luke's emphasis on the Olivet Discourse centers around the fall of Jerusalem and the captivity of the Jews and the domination of their city by the Romans. Mark emphasizes the danger to our faith. He's focused on what it's going to do to our beliefs and our faith. Will we be able to withstand persecution? We need to be ready. Because things are coming after Jesus' crucifixion. And he tells us, watch out! That no one deceives you. At least three different times Jesus warned his disciples to watch out, be on guard. So in other words, he's saying, don't be caught being asleep. Don't be caught napping. Live your life with a sense of alertness and a sense of awareness. Because these things are coming and I want you to be prepared because I want you to stand firm. And he laid some groundwork as he answered this question by pointing out certain non-signs. He gives us a list of nine signs that we don't need to worry about. And these are the signs that have deceived so many people throughout history. Well, we just had the, the, the earthquake of the century. Must mean the end of the world is coming. We just had the storm of the century. Must mean the world is coming to an end. Well, we've got this country and that country at war. We've been at world wars. That must be the end of, the, of, the, of civilization as we know it. Well, the first non-sign that Jesus points out is the claims of others to be the Messiah. Jesus taught that popular religious leaders would claim to be just that, and they would have a solution for the problems of life. I am the Messiah, they'll shout. I am the second coming of Christ. And let me tell you how we need to live our lives to move forward, to take care of these problems. Well, Jesus warned his disciples, don't be deceived by any of these imposters. Dr. Charles Feinberg, who's a noted Jewish Christian scholar, says that in the course of just Israel's history since the time of our Lord, no less than 64 different individuals have appeared to come and claim to be the Messiah. Well, we also have seen it in a lot of these so-called Christian cults as well. They come in the name of Jesus, but what they teach has nothing to do with what Jesus taught. They don't even resemble the words that came from his mouth or what the Bible says. They're in effect saying, I am he. But what they teach is a far cry from the biblical presentation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says this is a deceptive device that they're using. And it's designed to lead people astray. They're following the pattern of the great liar, Satan himself. A little truth mixed with a lot of lies and that can take people away. That's why it's so critical for us to be like the Bereans, to study the word of God, to test the things that we hear against the word of God so that we will not be deceived as so many are. Amen. Many have been led astray. In fact, in recent decades, we remember over 800 people lost their lives by following Jim Jones the whack job into Jonestown, Guyana. 
They drank the Kool-Aid. We make fun of it sometimes in, in conversation. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Why do we say that? Because they were fooled. They were deceived. So when we say don't drink the Kool-Aid, that's meaning don't be deceived by what you're hearing. Many people were killed in a fire in the 90s that destroyed the complex of David Koresh in Waco, Texas. He claimed to be the Messiah and led dozens of people astray. And then we read in the news and saw present, uh, presented on the television the 30 suicides that took place in Los Angeles from that group that was known as Heaven's Gate. They believed that they found a way to determine when Jesus was coming, so let's all commit suicide in preparation for that. That sounds like a great thing to do. Jesus warned us not to be deceived by false prophets. Then in verses 7 and 8, Jesus also warned his disciples not to be deceived by political conflicts of wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now Mark's Roman audience that he was originally writing to would have been very um, susceptible to understanding this and paying attention to it. Why? Because they were living in a great time of unprecedented peace known as Pax Romana. And they had enjoyed that peace for quite some time, but eventually it would come to an end. Even through the fall of a great kingdom and a great power as the Roman Empire, it would prove to be catastrophic for anyone living under it. But even that did not mean the end was near. There were natural disasters such as earthquakes and famines. That does not indicate the end times. Jesus is saying these are non-signs. And he warned us of the dangers of making these types of events benchmarks that is the institution of the end times. Notice his statements here. He says, these are the beginning of birth pains. And then he says, and don't be alarmed. These things must take place, but it is not yet the end. All of these things seem to refer back to signs just to describe the beginning point, not the end. Think about a woman who's pregnant and about to give birth. What happens first? She has labor pains. Is that when the baby arrives? No. Those pains sometimes last for days and sometimes just hours, but that's the beginning of the process as the child becomes closer and closer to taking his first breath. But those signs of Labor pains are only the beginning. That's what Jesus is saying. And when you see all these things, that's just the beginning. The appearance of wars and persecution were all part of God's overall plan. So we should expect them. He's saying, be on watch, be alert, pay attention to those things and know that that's the beginning of the end, but that's not the end. Because there will be a period of immense suffering. And that word beginning suggests many more sufferings would come. So do not be deceived, Jesus declared. Be ready. Be on guard. Be alert. While waiting to be interviewed for a job as a Morse code operator, there was a group of young men who were qualified in that field who were waiting in a waiting room. And they were carrying on conversations and they were enjoying talking to their fellow applicants. And all of a sudden, one of these men jumped up, ran through the door, went straight to the office of the hiring manager, and he came out a few minutes later. I got the job! I got the job! They had missed it. What the hiring manager had done is he had sent Morse code over the sound system in the waiting room. And this one man paid attention to what he was hearing. And when he heard the message, he immediately went in and he was hired for the job. We need to be alert. We do need to pay attention to the signs, but Jesus has some additional information for us. Again, in verse 9, we see, but you be on guard. They will hand you over to local courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. And it is necessary that the gospel be preached to all nations. So when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand what you will say, but say whatever is given to you at that time. For it isn't you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. 
Children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Here we see to whom will it happen? To whom will it happen? Not only will there be trouble on a global level, but there's also going to be trials and persecutions on a personal level. Jesus, again, is challenging his disciples to be ready, to be alert, to be on guard. That's the same word that's used in verse 5. It's a present imperative. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. So if we are listening to this inside information that Jesus is giving his disciples, we need to be alert. We need to be on guard. We need to be ready. That's a command. Why does he issue the second challenge to be, uh, to be watchful, to be on guard? Because he knows difficult times are ahead for the faithful followers of King Jesus. And he wants them to be prepared. He wants them to know that suffering is coming. And it's going to come on two different levels. He said clearly they would suffer publicly. They will hand you over to the local courts. Jesus knew what he's talking about. That same thing happened to him just a few short days after he spoke these words to them. They would be publicly flogged in the synagogues and viewed as false teachers and traitors to the nation of Israel. That's exactly what they did to Jesus. Persecution for believers being flogged in the synagogues would begin in the local Jewish courts, which were the local councils. But then it would move to the higher courts where the governors and the kings would then become involved. We see that same pattern with what happened to Jesus. This is all part of God's plan for the gospel. He wants us to proclaim that truth. He says, you will stand before governors and kings. Because why? Because of me, he says, as a witness to them. And we see this whole event unfold for the, the first century church in the book of Acts. And Jesus declared, it is necessary for these things, these acts of persecution, for you to stand firm, for you to proclaim the gospel. It is necessary for those to take place so that the gospel will reach all the nations. All the people groups of the world need to hear the gospel before the end comes. So don't get discouraged. Instead, be encouraged because this is God's plan. We need to be faithful to speak the gospel of Jesus to everyone we meet. Notice how it happens because so many of us fear what we might say or whether it's going to be rejected or accepted. Listen to what he says. At that time, it's not you speaking. It's the Holy Spirit. Do you think I need to worry about what I'm going to say if the Holy Spirit within me is the one who's speaking? No, I don't. Neither do you. We need to, to trust God. We need to rely on him. We need to be in faithful communion with him. We need to be obedient to do what the word of God says so we don't break off that communion with God because of unconfessed sin. We need to stay faithful to him. Man, persecution will result in proclamation. It's incredible. Praise the Lord that he gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to endure those things and give us the right words to say at just the right moment in time. Sharing the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit is far more important than looking for the signs of end times. Not only would they face public humiliation, but they would face private persecution. Some would come from their, old fam their own families. Opposition from government and legal authorities will be harsh. Rejection by family and friends is painful. It's heartbreaking, but it's going to happen. For some of you, it's already happened. Brother will betray brother to death and a father, his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. That word death occurs here twice. Anytime you see something repeated, pay attention to it. It emphasizes the extent to which the betrayal and persecution for some will happen. Even unto death. Those who first became followers of Jesus Christ were part of a family of Orthodox Jews. They came out of Judaism. And for them to proclaim to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they would be cast out from their family. It was as if they were dead because they followed Christ. 
Christians would be arrested, beaten, betrayed, put to death, and hated, all for the sake of who? Jesus. The Roman Empire considered anyone who did not declare Caesar as Lord to be a traitor, and they could be put to death for failure to acknowledge that. Both Jews and Gentiles who trusted Jesus could expect persecution from the government and from their own families because of their faith. But this hatred, this persecution would not be limited to just government and relatives because Jesus also says, all men will hate you because of me. So if you claim to be a Christian today, be ready. The world hates Jesus, therefore the world hates you. So don't be surprised. When they get mad at you for speaking the truth from the word of God. Don't be surprised when they don't want to be around you. Because they don't like hearing the truth. Because when they hear the truth, the truth will penetrate. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It will tell them they need to change. They need to submit to the one who is in charge. And they're not willing to get off that throne of self. So be ready for it. The world will hate you. If we identify with Christ, we can expect persecution, even from some who we love the most. Well, this kind of persecution might sound unbelievable to some of you, because we really haven't even scratched the surface of what's happened around the world. All you have to do is look into Fox's Book of Martyrs, and you'll see stories of faithful believers who sealed their witness for Jesus Christ with their own blood. They would not recant. They would not turn away from their faith. Church tradition informs us that all of the apostles, with the exception of, of John, were martyrs. John was persecuted, poured him in a, a vat of hot oil over him, but he survived it. So then they put him on the island of Patmos until he died of old age. Some have estimated that more than 70 million Christians have given their lives for their witness to Jesus. And 45 of those 70 million have happened in the 20th century. In the last decade, according to research, there were on average 270 new Christian martyrs every 24 hours. That's 10 an hour plus that are being put to death for their faith and their proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're going to be hated, folks, if we're faithful to our witness for the Lord. But Jesus tells us to be encouraged. Why? Because the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Amen. It's only temporary. There is hope at the end of the journey. This phrase doesn't imply a doctrine of salvation by works. That, that's farthest from what he's saying. Jesus was emphasizing that genuine faith that's revealed through trials and tests will prove a person to be able to endure until the end. As one man said, hammering hardens steel, but it crushes putty. A hammer hardens steel, but it crushes putty. Those who have genuine faith in Christ will not give up their faith under this kind of persecution. Perseverance is the proof that our profession of faith and that our salvation and our belief in Jesus Christ is real and genuine. It may be tough, but our Lord tells us he will be faithful to keep us until the end. Can I get an amen? Amen. Vance Havner used to say this. He said, faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. Faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. This is especially true when we experience severe persecution. It really separates the wheat from the chaff. It was certainly true in the first century. It's been true up to the 21st century. And it will be true in the, in the coming future as long as history continues to move towards this climactic end that Jesus begins to tell us about. Even today, we see the signs of persecution in our own country. In fact, just last week, the Senate move forward legislation called the Respect for Marriage Act. And it opens the door for litigation against individuals, against institutions, against churches, and against organizations who believe in the biblical 
definition of marriage of one man married to one woman in a covenant with God for life. If you disagree with that, persecution's coming. They're laying the groundwork right now. Christians will be attacked for their belief and their stance of a biblical covenant marriage. When a society abandons God, which our nation seems to be doing by leaps and bounds, then evilness and wickedness is quick to fill that void. So we need to stand stronger than ever. Will Campbell tells the story of an Anabaptist woman who lived in Antwerp, Belgium, and she had been arrested for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. She had learned it by reading the scriptures and studying it with others of like faith. And she became a martyr. She came under the inquisition of the religious leaders of the day and she was found to be heretical. And she was tortured, but she would not succumb to the pressure. And after six months, she still would not commit to promise to stop speaking the word of Christ, just like the apostles did. You remember what they said? We can't stop speaking about this Jesus. Do what you got to do, is what they were basically saying to the rulers. Well, she followed in their footsteps. So the authorities responded and did what they thought was necessary, and they sentenced her to death on October 5th, 1573. And you know what the sentence had a stipulation of because they did not want her to speak another word on her way to the place where they were going to burn her alive at the stake they instructed the executioner to take a screw and drive it through her tongue into the roof of her mouth so that she would not be able to speak the name of Jesus her own children were taken to the place of execution and they witnessed their mother being burned to death at the stake But her son did something amazing. After the ashes cooled, after the flames settled, he dug through the ashes and he found that screw that held her tongue to the roof of her mouth. And he kept it until he died as a reminder that he would never be silent to preach the gospel. This woman, in the midst of her persecution and her son, that ultimately led to her death, clearly demonstrates what it means to be the one who endures to the end, will be delivered. That word delivered literally means it will reveal that they are saved. Our trials, our troubles, our struggles, our persecutions, they reveal the genuineness of our faith and what we believe. In fact, throughout our suffering, the gospel uh, is displayed in our lives. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9 says this. Now we have this treasure. What is the treasure? The gospel in clay jars. Who's the clay jar? Us. So that this extraordinary power may be from God and not, for us, not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but what? Not crushed. We are perplexed, but what? Not in despair. We are persecuted, but what? We are never abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. If we stand firm in our faith, we can be beaten. We can be knocked down, but we will get back up by the power of God himself. And we will not be destroyed because we will be with him for eternity. You know, it's so easy for us to focus on our problems and think, that they're much bigger and much larger than they really are. Most of us here have never endured this kind of persecution that we've talked about today for our faith. Maybe we've had some family or friends that we've shared the gospel with reject us, but none of them have tried to kill us before, to my knowledge. But there will come a day, and it might be in our lifetime, where we must make this same life and death decision that the apostles made and that countless Christians around the world have made to be loyal to Christ regardless of the consequences. So will we stand firm for what is right? 
or will we be silent to escape and avoid trouble? Now that we've been given this inside information from Jesus himself, what are we going to do with it? Will we be faithful to the end? Will we be alert? Will we stand firm? Will we pay attention? Will we obey? I'm here to tell you, you can't do it in your own strength. You can only do it through Christ and his gift of the Holy Spirit that will allow us to endure. We know what's coming. We've been given the inside information. Question is, are you ready? And are you prepared? As Jesus commanded us to be. Let's pray.